This week could be the most pivotal so far in the two-month-old Trump presidency. Tomorrow, Mr. Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Neil Gorsuch, goes before the Senate Judiciary Committee for his confirmation hearing. Also, the first public hearing on possible ties between Russia and the Trump campaign gets underway. And the Republican bill to repeal and replace Obamacare may be headed for a vote on the House floor. Joining us now, live from Janesville, Wisconsin, is House Speaker Paul Ryan. Mr. Speaker, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Hey, good morning, Chris. Thanks for having me. Will you bring the repeal and replace bill to the House floor on Thursday, as some people have suggested? And if so, does that mean that you now have the votes to pass it? Yeah, that is our plan. I think Thursday is most likely going to be our day to bring it forward. Uh, we bring it to the Rules Committee first. So part of our regular order process is to go through four committees. We're now going to go to the Rules Committee and so we feel very good where we are. We're still having conversations with our members. We're making fine-tuning improvements to the bill to reflect people's concerns, to reflect people's improvements. Uh, the president, you say people are being at the seat at the table. Uh, the president is being, bringing people to his table. And I'm very impressed with how the president is helping us close this bill, making the improvements that we've been making, getting the votes. And so we feel very good where we are. We like the process because it's the regular order process. We're going to make those changes at the Rules Committee that the Budget Committee and others have asked for. And so we feel like we're on track and we're doing, we're right where we want to be. So what would you say are the prospects that you have the votes and we'll be able to pass it on Thursday? Yeah, I feel very good about it, actually. I feel like exact, it's exactly where we want to be. And the reason I feel so good about this is because the president has become a great closer. Uh, he is the one who has helped to negotiate changes to this bill with members from all over our caucus. I call it getting the sweet spot. You've got to get 218 Republicans who come from all different walks of life to come together to agree on the best possible plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. And the reason I feel very good where we are, we all, all of us, all Republicans in the House, Senate, and the President made a promise to the American people that we would repeal and replace this faulty, collapsing law, and we're going to make good on that promise. You talk about changes. You're going to offer what is known up on the Hill as a manager's amendment to reflect the changes you're going to make to try to pick up uh, the final votes you need. And I want to go through some of the items that are being discussed about that. Uh, allow states to impose a work requirement for able-bodied Medicaid recipients. Allow states to accept a fixed block grant for Medicaid and boost the tax credits for lower income and older people. Mr. Speaker, will all of those items be in the manager's amendment? Yeah, those are all things that we are working on in the manager's amendment. We're making sure that we get all the language right. As you know, we have this weird thing called the bird rule, which is reconciliation. So we're making sure that these changes that were being discussed conform with this. And so we've gotten lots of feedback from conservatives, from governors, from people all walks of life in our conference, from different perspectives about changes they think improve this bill. We are working on the kinds of changes you just described. And we're going through that process and we're going to bring those changes uh, to the Rules Committee. You have been talking about this, calling it a binary choice. Either you accept the GOP bill or you have to stay with Obamacare as it exists and, as a lot of people say, as it's collapsing. But now you're talking about making changes. And this week, President Trump said this. If we're not going to take care of the people, I'm not signing anything. I'm not going to be doing it, just so you understand. Right. I'm in a little way, I'm an arbitrator. In fact, there are going to be changes, as you say, this week in the House. There are going to have to be even more changes in Congress. Uh, respectfully, sir, isn't your binary choice out the window? No, you're misinterpreting me. Uh, the binary choice is when we bring this to a vote, that's when it becomes a binary choice. Until we bring the bill to the floor, we are always making improvements. There's one word to describe what's going on, legislating. We are not actually doing this behind the scenes and just bringing some bill to the floor and making people vote for it. We're listening to people. And the president's right. He is the one. It's, we've never had this before. That's why I'm very excited. We have a president who's rolling up his sleeves. He's, learned, he's, he's a very quick learner on health care. He's, he's a business guy who came to presidency. And now he's helping us make sure that we bridge differences with members who are bringing constructive ideas and solutions for how to make this bill better. Four committee process. We got the fourth committee coming up. That's always been the plan, to always learn, listen, negotiate, and improve the bill, make the fine-tuning, and then bring the bill to the floor. And that is where it then becomes a binary choice. That's what I meant all along when I've said this, which is, when we bring this to a vote, either we're going to keep the Obamacare status quo, the law is collapsing, five states have one plan left, 
Over a third of the, of the counties in America have only one insurer left. Some are already pulling out. Massive premium increases in the future, a collapsing law, or we replace it with patient-centered health care that works, where we give people more freedom, where we let the states go back to running their health insurance markets. That is what we ran on. This is the plan we ran on all of last year. And we've been working with the administration hand in glove and the Senate since January to put this together. And when this vote comes up, that's when it will be a binary choice. Either we're for the status quo or we're for repealing and replacing this law. Mr. Speaker, as a governing principle, do you believe that every American should be able to get health care insurance if they want it? Yes, I do believe this is a critical need for Americans, and I do believe that we can have in this country a health care system where everyone can get access to affordable health care coverage, including people with pre-existing conditions. I believe that that is achievable. I believe that that is what we are achieving in this legislation, and the answer is not a government one-size-fits-all, arrogant, micromanaging system where the government forces you to buy something you don't want, don't need, or can't afford. The goal here is to give every American access to affordable coverage. That means we have to bring the cost of health care down. But, that means but, we don't want monopolies. But, Mr. We want Speaker, competition, let me, let me, let me and pick, that is what we are achieving. Let me pick up on this, because the, the Congressional Budget Office, I don't have to tell you, came out this week with a pretty dramatic uh, forecast, and they said that 24 million fewer Americans will have health insurance in 10 years under your plan. You said that part of that is that this is what freedom looks like. Here you are. This isn't a government mandate. This is not the government makes you buy what we say you should buy, and therefore the government thinks you're all going to buy it. But, sir, is, is the major decrease in the number of people, according to the CBO, who will have health insurance, is it freedom, or is it that some people will no longer be able to afford health insurance under your plan? I want to show a specific case that the CBO put up. Look at these numbers. In 10 years, the CBO said, a 64-year-old with an income of $26,500 will pay $1,700 out of pocket under Obamacare for health insurance. Under your plan, the CBO says, that same person will have to pay $14,600 because insurance companies can charge more and the tax credit that you're going to offer is smaller than the subsidy that Obamacare will offer. So, so what they're saying is this isn't freedom. This isn't people voluntarily deciding not to have health insurance. It's that your plan makes it unaffordable for people. So uh, there's three things I would say. Number one, what they basically say is people, uh, Obamacare is not going to last. There's no way Obamacare could stick another two or three years, let alone 10 years. And so they're comparing an Obamacare plan that's mythical, that won't exist in 10 years. Then they're saying, well, if, if people are going to buy what Obamacare is going to make them buy, uh, then they won't be able to afford it. Here's the point. We believe that we do need to add some additional assistance to people in those older cohorts. But the, the apples to oranges comparison that's happening here is we're not going to make people buy something that's so expensive that they can't afford that the market's not going to offer. And so where I dispute that comparison is it suggests that we're going to have the same kinds of plans being offered in 10 years that Obamacare would otherwise offer. But, sir, I mean, it just, won't just, because just to get it to is two, collapsing. If I may. No, no, but just let me, it, well, let if, me get back to that. I just the want point to get to you're making is the... But I want to get to two points because no, under Obamacare... The older person, if, Chris, I'm, just real quick. I, yeah, go ahead. Now, let me just You're say, the, the older person, the person in their 50s and 60s, the, the, the person in their 50s and 60s does have additional health care costs than, say, a person in their 20s and 30s. The tax credit adjusts for that, but you're right in saying, and we agree, we believe we should have even more assistance, and that's one of the things we're looking at for that person in their 50s and 60s, because they experience higher health care costs. So you're going to change, the, your, you're going to change the plan is, as it we're was going written to, and the CBO analyzed it. That is among the things we're looking at doing, yes. And the point I would say is we're going to let people buy what they want to buy. We're going to have more plans being offered, more choice and competition. And this is before Tom Price does anything to deregulate the marketplace, to bring more competition and lower prices, which the CBO could not and did not analyze. So the CBO looked at a little piece of the issue when we know that the, the secretary of HHS will help bring market freedom and regulatory relief to the health insurance markets to dramatically lower the price of plans for those 50 and 60 year olds. But even with that, we think that we, we should be offering even more assistance than what the bill currently does. Okay. That's the point I'm trying to make. No, I understand then. Uh, Thanks let, for indulging. Let me turn in the time we have left, <laughs> sir, uh, to the budget that the Trump administration offered uh, this week. Here's budget director Mick Mulvaney. 
this is a hard power budget, that this administration intends to change course from a soft power budget to a hard power budget. And what he basically means by that is they're going to be big defense increases, spending increases, and they're going to be offsetting and sizable decreases in a lot of domestic discretionary programs. Are you comfortable, and I want to talk about two in specific, because what it really gets down to is not big numbers, but specific programs. Are you comfortable with cutting the National Institutes of Health by 20 percent? Are you comfortable with cutting funding for Meals on Wheels, which supplies food to two, and, and seniors depend on it, to two and a half million <clears throat> elderly Americans? Well, I would say this is the very, very beginning of the budget process, a process I've worked with for many years. Uh, they submitted their budget. It will go through the congressional system. Um, what typically happens is a president submits their budget, and then Congress takes it from there and makes necessary changes to that budget going forward. We're encouraged that we're seeing an increase in defense because we think our military has been hollowed out. Uh, but I will say that, that NAH is something that's particularly popular in Congress. We just passed the Cures Act just this last December um, to increase um, spending in the NIH because we really think we're kind of getting close to some breakthrough um, discoveries on, on cancer and other uh, diseases. So that's something that I think in Congress you'll see probably some changes. Uh, but with respect to any one of these types of programs, this is the beginning of a very long multi-stage process of budgeting. And I do believe at the end of the day we're going to honor these priorities, um, and particularly our defense spending priorities. And so I'm glad that the administration got going. I want financial pressure. I want spending caps because that makes us focus on, on cutting spending that is wasteful spending. There are a lot of programs that are duplicative, that are wasteful, um, that aren't measuring up to the, to, the, to the goals that they're supposed to achieve. And you want that kind of fiscal pressure, so you go after waste, you go after fraud, you go after abuse, and you move money from programs that aren't succeeding or working or achieving their goals to those that do while we honor our priorities. So this is just the beginning of that long process, and I'm, I'm encouraged that we're up and starting with it. That's what I'm really mostly encouraged about is the White House gave us numbers so we can get started. That's what encourages me. I got less than a minute left. I want to ask you finally about uh, President Trump. We're now into week three of his allegation uh, that uh, the Obama administration wiretapped Trump Tower this week. Uh, he swept the Brits into it. He swept the Germans into it. The question I have is, sir, and I don't expect you to comment on that, but isn't this a big distraction from the, the very ambitious legislative agenda that you're trying to get through Congress? Yeah, it's why I focus on the very ambitious agenda that I'm trying to get through Congress. I'm not really focused on these things, I'm only to the extent that we have a committee that's investigating. I think you have the chairman coming on next. So the president and, and Congress is already working on this. They've asked us to investigate this. We're going to investigate each and every one of these things, all things related to Russia. That investigation is ongoing. It's not complete. So let's see this investigation run its course. But we have not seen evidence of, of any of the like that you just described. I think you'll probably get that same kind of answer from Chairman Nunes in a few minutes. Would you like this to be over with quickly? I, I want to get on with uh, passing our agenda. And you know what? We are. So I'm pretty, I'm in a good place. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thanks for your time. And of course, we'll be tracking what happens in the House this week. Thanks again, sir. You bet. Thanks, Chris.